The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. Welcome, guys, and happy Wednesday. We have a special guest here today that we are excited to have with us. Um, But first, we are going to start with the quirky tip of the day. And we got the green pig for the green shirt. See, we got the last shirts going. Tip of the day. We got the new quirky dog apparel. Get yourselves a t-shirt or a sweatshirt so you can get out there when you're... um, Doing your hunting with your dog. Oh, that's good. Good tie-in. Good tie-in with the and hunting. it be nice and warm. Uh, free shipping in the U.S., guys. Click the link in the description, and uh, apparel will be closed for good um, on Halloween, October 31st. So today we have Wes Reed from Rise and Shine Retrievers, and uh, he lives in Center Barnstead, New Hampshire. So thanks, Wes, for joining us here today. Thanks for having me. And, we, you know, and we're each getting a free puppy for this. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse's all around. All right, so just tell us a little bit um, about what you do and who you are. Um, I know that you're a big name in the hunting world, especially here in New England, and we just want to share with our listeners a little bit about what hunting is and, you know, the specific breeds that are built for it and all that. Well, like I said, we, are, we have a full-service retriever kennel located in Center Barnstead, New Hampshire. We offer all levels of retriever training for both waterfowl and upland, and we also breed Labrador and Chesapeake Bay retrievers from health-tusted parents. Cool. Great. And how many litters do you have a year, roughly? How many? Uh, between between two and four. Okay. Um, Mother Nature has dealt us some cruel blows lately. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We've had some litters that uh, didn't take or come to fruition for whatever reason, but typically two to four litters a year. And that's pretty spread between labs and chassis, or do you have a preference? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. And what's the average size litter? About six, six or eight? I've had everything from one to 13. Wow. 13 is a big litter. We just had uh, that litter just went home. It was uh, 13 Labradors. Uh, one puppy was stillborn, so we ended up with 12. Wow, that's and big. Then, uh, those puppies uh, were born July 19th, so they just went to their new homes a couple weeks ago. Well, it must be a lot quieter at your place now, huh? Uh, no, not really, because we kept one of the puppies. <laughs> <laughs> and now that one's lonely, <laughs> maybe yeah. even a little bit louder. <laughs> Um, she has plenty of friends here. Yeah. How is the, how are you, the only experience I have with the Chesapeake's is aggression issues. Do you think that's a, a breed specific issue or you think there's some genetics that are maybe as a poor breeding that creates that type of situation? No, for years, you got to remember the, the original uh, purpose behind the Chessie was to, was to guard the hunter's uh, belongings while the hunter took the ducks to market. Oh, that makes um, sense. Your your uh, reputable breeders have worked tirelessly for years to kind of breed that out of them. Right. Um, I'll tell people when I'm choosing a Chesapeake stud that uh, temperament is more important than titles. Right. Uh, there's no sense of having a show champion or a master hunter uh, Chesapeake that uh, is ugly. So my my last litter of eight Chesapeake puppies went to seven went to repeat customers. And uh, my happiest Chessie customers are people that have had Chessies and either had temperament or health issues, and they received one of my puppies, and they had neither. So um, we've got four generations of Chesapeake's on the ground, and we've got five generations of labs. So I've got a pretty good handle on what what I produce. And you know what kind of home they need to be in also because they're working dogs too. Correct. Um, About... um, 50-50 50-50 with the labs, about 50% go to working homes and about 50% go to pet homes. With the Chessies, it's closer to 80% go to working homes and 20% go to pet homes. Yeah. I had people I had people ask me, do you prefer your dogs go to a working home? I said, no, I prefer my dogs to go to a good home. Yeah, of course. The dog can go to a working home and still not be a good environment for the dog. Sure. And do you sell puppies locally mostly or do you ship throughout the states or how does that work? Uh, we don't ship, but we have had people come. You can fly puppies on airplanes now. Yep. Uh, we lit- we do have puppies from, from uh, Maine to California. Um, I have not sold any to uh, Canada or, or Mexico yet, but... Well, you can't get puppies to Canada these days. <laughs> the, majority of, uh, the majority of our buyers are 
are on the East Coast. The last litter, we had one pup that went to Ohio, and all the rest of the puppies were in the New England area. Nice. And then we're talking about Chessies, and we obviously know about Chesapeake Bay Retrievers, but can you explain the breed a little bit for our listeners who aren't as familiar with that breed? And it kind of looks like a curly lab a little bit to me. Yeah, a lot of people think that Chesapeake is a is a, uh, a lab with a different colored coat, and it's not. A completely different temperament. Yeah. Uh, we like to invite people to the house to meet us and meet the dogs. We like to get to know the owners, so we make sure that the owners are matched up with the right puppy when the time comes. Uh, the two uh, sayings that are out there about the Chesapeake is, a lab you train, a Chesapeake you negotiate with. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lab thinks... He feeds me, he loves me, he gives me shelter, he must be a god. The Chesapeake thinks, he feeds me, he loves me, he gives me shelter, I must be a god. (laughs) (laughs) Subtle subtle differences, um, but big differences. (laughs) Completely different creature. Uh, We love him or you hate him. Um, Luckily, you know, the worst thing for a breed these days is popularity. Yeah. Everybody starts breeding them. Yeah, And there are only a handful of, of dedicated Chesapeake breeders um, here on the East Coast and in the Northeast, so they're not the easiest to find sometimes. But um, like I said, you either love them or hate them, and we happen, to, we happen to love them. I was hunting with one this morning. Yeah, that's nice. Did you start with labs or Chessies? Well, the funny thing, yeah, I, I started with labs, <clears throat> and I started running the, the hunt test events with the second lab that I own. And she breezed right through the program, and she was very, very easy to train. And I said to myself that I wanted more than more of a challenge, and that's when I got my first male Chessie. And trust me, he was a challenge. Yeah. I, um, when I got the dog, I thought, this is the weirdest dog in the world. And then I got my second Chessie, and I, th- it came to thought that it wasn't, he wasn't the weirdest dog in the world. He was just a Chessie. They're all like that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, one thing I liked about the ones I worked with, and I don't know if it's typical, but very muscular dogs, really well-built, good-sized dogs, the ones I was working with. Yes. I had. Uh, I was doing a hunt down on Cape Cod last year in January, and I had one of my Chessies with me, and uh, she was literally breaking ice yeah. uh, to make the retrieves. And, you know, a lot of people think that that was, you know, cruel or dog abuse or whatever. These dogs are, are made for it. Our property, we have 1,400 feet of frontage on a river, and our dogs will run down and jump in the river literally year-round. Yeah, they have a lot of drive. Do you do... Um, That's it, I'm getting a Chessie. <laughs> so easy. That's how easy he capes. Do you do yellow labs, black labs, and chocolate labs, all three? Well, I started out with, I started out with yellow labs. Uh, we, did get a, we did get a black lab. This last litter was uh, black and chocolate, which was actually our first chocolate litter. We have um, a yellow dog that was in the breeding program. She actually had a litter of five puppies, and she was going to be our yellow producing dog. And for whatever reason, she has failed to get pregnant her last three times with three different boyfriends. Mm. So, and, you know, I'll just throw out there, I just found out last week our Chesapeake uh, reabsorbed her entire litter of puppies uh, between day 30 and day 40 of her pregnancy. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry to hear that. So when people say to me that they want to breed dogs, I like to enlighten them as to what what that entails. What they're yeah. in for, yeah. It's not for the faint of heart, that's for sure. So we have not have, I currently do not have a yellow that I'm breeding. I have, a, I have a black that, like I said, just had the litter of 12. We'll be breeding her again. She'll be having a litter late winter, early spring next year. My plan is the following year to breed her to a yellow and hopefully get yellow puppies once again to integrate into our breeding program. Yeah, to have one that you, you can have breed. You have to stop and realize that just because you have a black lab, it may also have chocolate and or yellow genes in its background. Yeah. So there are, if I remember correctly, there are 73 different color combinations when you breed a lab. Crazy, huh? Mm-hmm. Silver isn't one of them, right? <laughs> No, you, you know, I said, you, correct, thank you. Um, or, or champagne or um, some of the other designer breeds. Yeah. Um, so Becca, I know, is, is black, and I know she's chocolate factored. So I'm going to have to do a coat color DNA test on her if 
she is black chocolate and yellow factored, then I would breed her to a yellow in hopes of getting yellow puppies. Now, once again, I would make sure that the dog I'm breeding to is yellow, period, without any chocolate and or black genes in its background. Black being a dominant color, I would may very well end up with all black puppies um, instead of yellow. So there's a there's a little bit of a there's a little bit of a trick there, mm-hmm. and uh, a little bit of science involved, and it doesn't always come out as you plan because it's mother nature. Yeah, exactly. And is it just you and your wife raising the puppies? Yes, although my my grown son um, and daughter in law are very involved. We um, if we want to go on a vacation, that's um, nice. Nice. Yeah, they come and stay at the house. They're they're. We do have a couple other people that we we trust, but uh, you know these are my babies. I don't trust them with just anybody. Yeah, we're you're preaching to the cry over here. You there? Yeah. And what? then I was going to say, my kids grew up with dogs, and they ran for the hills as soon as they were eighteen. <laughs> <laughs> they're not around to be taking care of dogs for me. <laughs> my son, my son just turned. Now let me think. Make sure I get it right. My son just turned. My youngest son just turned twenty nine. And he's been going training slash hunting with me since he was four. Oh, that's, that's nice. awesome. That's a nice little relationship builder there for you and your uh, son. Can I say on a side note, the first dog I ever trained, a board and train for a companion animal that they called me with a big problem was a black lab female. And the problem they had was the dog was constantly picking something up and pushing at them to play fetch. And if God forbid they threw it, they couldn't stop the dog from retrieving. <laughs> this was their problem, you know? And it was, so, it was such a great dog to train. I mean, I had this dog off leash. She would do anything, like you said. She just loved to work, and they just didn't understand the dog, you know? But I was right. able, to, able to get that dog off leash, and they had a great time after we got some training into the dog, and they learned how to work with that dog. It was awesome. Yeah, labs can be really nice, but obviously in the pet dog world, we see nice ones and not so nice ones, too. Not all bred like yours. We are going to go to break super quick, and then when we get back, we are going to talk more about Wes and his dogs and also his hunting because yeah, let's it's talk hunting about, season. Let's talk about training. All right. We'll see you after break, guys. What makes Coranda Beds chew-proof? Only Coranda Beds have a patented design which secures the fabric inside the frame, making it totally inaccessible to jaws and paws. Your dog can't chew the fabric because we've hidden the edges inside the rails. Dogs love Coranda Beds. See why? Coranda Beds come in a variety of custom sizes. You can even add a fleece pad on top for extra coziness. And these beds can be used both indoors and outdoors. But best of all, our beds are easy to clean. Just wipe them off or hose them down. Visit dogbed.us slash the quirky dog for more details. Okay, Wes, Jess wanted me to ask you how many dogs you have, but what I'd really like to ask you <laughs> is, do you prefer males to females, and do you make sure that all the females you breed are also titled? Because in the sport that I have been involved in for years, uh, the females weren't necessarily titled. They were more uh, chosen for their temperament and their genetics, and it was mostly males doing protection sports and that kind of stuff. Not that the females couldn't do it, but in Europe they tended to just use these females for breeding and not so much for actual sport. Yeah, I know I know a couple of breeders that um, have gone out and purchased females with, you know, super duper pedigrees and they don't really do anything with them, but they breed them to males with once again, super duper pedigrees. And then they, you know, produce, produce puppies with super pedigrees, although they really don't do much with the females. Right. Um, we have all girls. Uh, what on earth do I want a boy dog for? <laughs> um, the best hunting dog in the world is a spade female lab. Yeah. E- easy to train. No heat cycles. Um, I take in dogs for training, so obviously I, I do deal with, with, with males. But I, I, I find females much, much easier to work with. Mm-hmm. How many nice. personal females do you guys have? So we're, we're actually going through a bit of a transition right now. Um, we have a female yellow that is done with our breeding, breeding program that has gone off to learn how to become a hearing assist dog. Oh, cool. My wife has a friend who's going deaf and we've uh, we've decided that Joy is going to uh, 
be this woman's hearing assist dog. Nice. That's awesome. Said, she's, she's yellow and uh, she is six and they're actually having the meeting with the trainer and the woman that will be receiving the dog for the first time this week. So um, very excited, but that we were down, you know, that, that was one that I hated to, I yeah. hated to part with because they, like I said, they're all big family members, but I know that this dog will, will, you know, work wonders for this woman with the hearing issue. Yeah, that sounds good. Nice, nice and placement. The flip side of that is uh, literally uh, less than a week ago, I sold our first started hunting dog. Uh, the yellow that I talked about that failed to get pregnant the last three times. She is only five and has a lot of life left into her. And I found a gentleman that approached me about a dog. And although it was a very hard decision, uh, last Friday, that individual took possession of uh, Ruby, a five-year-old yellow lab of ours. So what that has left us with, and let me make sure I get everything right. Uh, Chessie Wise, we have Spice, who is four. We have Tulia, that is five. Spice's mother actually uh, has been to Westminster. Cool. And her mother received the Judges Award of Merit Ribbon at Westminster, and she was a gift of one of my training clients. And lab-wise, we have Dinah, who is the 13-week-old chocolate puppy that we kept out of the last litter. We have Dinah's mom, Becca, who's a black lab, three years old. We have Becca's mom, Bella, who is a black lab that is seven years old. And we have Lucy, who is 12 and a half years old. All right. So you're under 10. You're not that crazy. Oh, no. I, it's, that's too many. <laughs> oh, we know breeders um, with 40 or 50 dogs. Well, when I take in, I, I take in no more than six dogs at a time for training. Yeah. Um, I do everything by myself from cleaning the kennels to doing the training. So uh, that keeps me plenty busy. Yeah. And we also, you know, continue to work, continue to work with our dogs. I, I will speak to what you said a minute ago about uh, titles. Uh, I had mentioned before about with the Chesapeake boys, temperament's more important than titles. Uh, I do run hunt tests. Um, I've had several. I've run AKC, UKC, and NARA hunt tests at every level, title dogs at every level, including the Lab Breed Club, WC, and the Chessy Club, uh, WD, WD, X, WDQ programs. Um, so I'm like I said, I'm quite familiar with it. I have slacked off a little bit running my dogs just because it takes a lot of time and money. You're gone all weekend long. Yeah. Somebody will be here at the house to watch the dog. So um, it, it's definitely a labor of love. I, you know, I basically turn into a, uh, you know, a dog farmer. <laughs> exactly. Well, you said you were out hunting this morning with your chassis. So can you explain what that looks like um, just for people that aren't familiar with hunting dogs in the sport? Well, there's a, there's a saying that used to go around, uh, Preserve game, use a trained dog. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, you know, would scratch their head over that. Uh, for example, if I'm out hunting and I happen to wound a bird and it would fall into heavy cover, that being duck hunting or in an upland hunting scenario, pheasants, partridge, or whatever, um, that dog is invaluable in recovering that bird. Um, if I don't recover that bird, technically, uh, let's say it might for whatever reason, the species we're hunting is the limit is one bird per day. Well, if I wound that bird and knock it down and I can't recover it, then most hunters are going to go back and sit down and try to shoot another bird. Yeah. Right. With my dogs, well-trained dogs, hopefully um, they're able to, they're able to search out and recover that bird. I do hunt some fairly heavy cover. The swamp that we were in this morning is very, very challenging um, for the dog. We go back and talk about training and dealing with guns and live ammunition and wild animals that we don't have any control over. Safety is the utmost importance. Mm -hmm. So a dog that is well behaved, a dog that sits next to me until it's told to move is huge. Um, I can relay a story of a couple years ago of a guide that I know in Maine who had a dog shot on a duck hunt and killed it. Um, and it, it wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't a pretty sight. 
I went the uh, the hunt that I talked about that I went on last year at the Cape where the dog was breaking ice. Um, that guide obviously has a lot of clients bringing their dogs, which are not always that well trained. When the first flock of birds came in and we shot a duck, the guide looked at me and said, that's great. How did you get the dog to just sit there like that? <laughs> Well, once again, it's a, it's a safety issue. Yeah. yeah. That dog is running out in front of the guns as everybody jumps up to shoot or whatnot. As you can see, that's a very dangerous situation. So a well-trained dog is crucial um, to everybody's safety. And then it really makes the hunt for me. If I, if I couldn't hunt with a dog, I wouldn't go 10% as much as I do. Yeah. How many days a week are you hunting now? Uh, four or five. I have, um, I've with the breeding, I've got another Chesapeake bred. So for example, tomorrow I have to give up duck hunting because I have an eight o'clock vet appointment yeah. <laughs> uh, to do an ultrasound on the other Chesapeake to test, uh, to do, uh, to look for puppies. Yeah. At 30 days, we do an ultrasound to confirm pregnancy. It will give us some idea how many pups the female is carrying, but it's really difficult to tell. Around day 50, we do an x-ray, which allows us to get a little bit better, a little bit better count. Yeah. Um, I'll also throw out there that I'm, for lack of a better term, affiliated with two different shooting preserves here in New Hampshire, um, New England Upland Sporting Club in Hillsborough and the Timberdoodle Club in Temple, New Hampshire, are both uh, hundreds of acres of uh, property available to hunt, and I'm... Uh, I'm a member in one of the clubs so I can go over and hunt, but I also guide clients. So um, right now, oh, in fact, I got off the phone with the guy this morning. Right now, about once a week, um, I've got guiding assignments to, to take people out pheasant hunting on these preserves. Oh, cool. So yeah, it's sure. a little bit of, when I say four or five times a week, it's a little bit of myself hunting. Um, I may be at one of the preserves enjoying a hunt myself, or I may be at one of the preserves guiding. It sounds like um, hiring a guide would be great if you're a beginner and novice, you know, because you can take them right out to the best spot and coach them along the way, you know? Correct. Actually, uh, the gentleman that I took to my club yesterday, here's a, here's, a good, here's a good story. He bought a puppy from me last year in July, I believe it was, a Chessy puppy, no less. Um, he's an upland hunter. A lot of people don't use their chessies for upland hunting. And when I say upland hunting, we're talking partridge, woodcock, pheasant. Mm -hmm. And I got the dog back this spring for a couple of months of training. I really instilled basics. And then I got the dog back in September just for a couple weeks. And I treated the guy to a hunt yesterday over at the shooting club. So I didn't take a dog. We took him and his dog and we went over and enjoyed a shoot. And it was, like I said, it was just as much fun for me because it was one of my puppies. Mm -hmm. And it was also a dog that I had back for training. So to see the dog go out work, uh, we had an awesome afternoon. And I, and I thought, if I do say so myself, I thought the dog did awesome. <laughs> it's nice to see the culmination of all that training when you get out in the real world, you know? I was talking, my daughter-in-law went duck hunting with me this morning. And, and I was mentioning to her the hunt and how when the dog, you know, hits bird scent and gets birdie, and each dog is different. Some speed up, some slow down. And I was, I was talking to her about hunting with this dog yesterday. And, and she just looked at me and she said, that's what it's all about. That's the most enjoyable thing is watching the dogs work, watching them figure something out mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and retrieve a bird or, or create a flush to give us an opportunity to shoot. Well, and it's so fulfilling for them as well, because it's what they were bred to do. You well, know, yeah, they're they, living their best life also. Yeah, they can express oh, those the, genetics, yeah. The disappointed looks when we miss. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so how long have you been doing this? You seem as though you have quite a bit of experience in the hunting world. Well, I, um, I actually started with beagles. Um, I was an avid, it's the same, I did the same thing. I jump into everything with both feet. So I... <laughs> I initially started hunting with beagles because the season is so long. The rabbit season runs from the middle of the 1st of October to the end of March. So that's how I got started. And then in the early 80s, I met a gentleman who got me into duck hunting. And if you know anything about duck hunting, it's done on water. And if you shoot a duck, you have to go get it. Right. And dragging the canoe and or boat out of the bushes every time we shot a duck after a couple of years became a pain great big pain. Yeah. yeah. 
and I realized the the uh, worthy worth of a of a good retriever. So I got a male retriever, trained him. This would have been the early '80s, and um, started duck hunting. Got my second dog. Got into the events, and this is where I'll segue into health clearances, people. Yeah. Okay? Do your homework. Most people will do more research on a car that they're going to own for two to four years than a dog they're going to own for 10 to 15. Mm -hmm. When people call me up about puppies, I say, do you know what PRA is? And they say, no. And I say, do you know what EIC is? And they say, no. And then I run down a handful of other genetic diseases and they say, no. And I look at them and I say, you are what we call an uneducated consumer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, PRA is progressive retinal atrophy. If your dog has PRA, it's going to go blind. Mm -hmm. EIC is exercise induced collapse. It's a seizure during exercise. Now it's not just exercise, it's exercise combined with excitement or pressure mm -hmm. um, during the, during the, uh, the exercise. CNM is basically multiple sclerosis in dogs. Chessies have DM. Um, these are all very easily Detected. Tested for yeah. your breeding stock. And if you contact a breeder and you say, do you test for PRA? The only acceptable answer is yes. Mm -hmm. You will have people that will say, oh, I've been breeding for 20 years and I've never had a problem. You don't want to be their first problem. Right. All right? Everybody knows about hips and elbows. But there's, there are a host of other diseases out there. Some of them breed specific. Like, for example, DM doesn't generally affect Labradors. It's a Chesapeake thing. Yeah. yeah. So I'd say to people, do your homework, do a little bit of research, and find a reputable breeder. The problem is, and during this pandemic, it has been absolutely horrible, everybody wants a dog now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, my lab waiting list is two years away. Mm-hmm. So, um, do your homework. I tell people that call me up, I don't need to sell you a puppy. My phone rings off the hook for puppies. Matter of fact, I looked this morning in the last two days, I have gotten 18 emails for puppies. So I don't need to sell you a puppy. However, and people want me to recommend breeders. I do not recommend breeders. You don't recommend. What I will do is I will educate you as to the questions you need to ask. And if this is the, and the answers that you need to receive, and if you do not receive those answers, don't buy hang, up, yep. hang up the phone and run. Yep. Because for a, literally for a couple hundred dollars, you can get a, a handful of very common genetic issues. And if you're a reputable breeder, why would you not want to turn out quality puppies? Yeah. Do you use Embark or paw print for your genetics? I've used paw print and I also have used uh, DDC. Uh -huh. And it's funny you said about Embark. I just got a uh, coupon in the mail. <laughs> they are expensive, but they're good with the color testing too. I know from yeah, I just color. Got, I just got a coupon in the mail the other day from them for, for a, I think it was a 25% discount. Well, maybe so. it's a sign. Maybe you should try them next. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Do you have any closing thoughts for Wes? Well, yeah, I still want to talk about training. All right, go ahead. One more we? question. Um, I wanted to ask you about, you do a uh, forced retrieve with your dogs, with your young dogs. Okay. So real quick, I'll, I'll make this as painless as possible. <laughs> it's very common, very common in the retriever world now to you force fetch the dogs and use an e-collar. Yeah. I do not, I do not use either, which is why I'm very busy with my training. Right. I have nothing against an e-collar. An e-collar is a tool, just like a leash, mm -hmm. just like a healing stick, just like your voice. Your voice is a tool. Right. Okay? The problem with an e-collar is not the collar, it's the individual using holding the transmitter. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, the whole force fetch thing, I have sent dogs home from my training program because they don't love birds. They don't they don't want to um, hold. Yeah. One of the first things I do when I get a dog is introduce it to a live bird to make sure that the prey drive is there. Right. If you're force fetching the dog, then you're forcing the dog to pick up the bird. Right. You're, you're forcing the dog to work. Um, I prefer to start out with a dog that has the genes and the drive in place 
And then I just I just work with that uh, work with that versus, like I said, everything based on force. Yeah, they make there's you look great. Against, there's nothing against those programs. If that's what you want to do, that's not what I'm about. Well, I was thinking uh, if you're working with an off breed that doesn't have the genetics, the only way you're going to get them to like I've had people say, I want you to get my ball, my dog to fetch a ball. The dog has no desire to chase a ball or let alone pick it up. And I tell them it's not going to happen. That's not, you know, the dog doesn't want to do it. If they want to do it, it's easy to put some structure on it, get them to bring it back and sit and whatnot. But if they don't want to do it, it's a big uphill battle, you know? Well, funny thing, um, people ask me about, once we get into the more formal retriever training, people ask me about playtime. Right. My wife plays with the dogs. She takes them out. She throws the ball. She has a great time. Nobody has to be steady. Nobody has to deliver the hand. Right. All that good stuff. Loose. When they come out with me, it's birds or bumpers, and there's a whole different set of rules. Right. So a lot of people ask me about, well, can we go play with the dog? Yes, you can. However, that's play. This is work. There are things that you have to do in your job that you don't like to necessarily do, but you do it because it's part of your job. It's the same thing with the retrievers. There are going to be things that we teach them that may, may, we may have a little bit of an uphill battle on because it's not necessarily natural for them. Um, however, it's part of their job. And as long as we teach them properly, um, it, it should be an issue. And, and part of that is um, whenever that my dogs go out and retrieve a bird or a bumper, that dog comes back, sits down at heel, and puts that bird slash bumper in my hand. Um, that's, that's the first bit of training that I, that's the first bit of training that I do after introducing them to a bird. Do you have uh, frozen birds in your freezer? Yes, sir. I got a freezer full, one whole freezer <laughs> specifically, specifically dedicated yeah. to birds. Yeah. It's not even Thanksgiving specific. Oh, it's been great talking to you. I'm thinking I should put my name on your list because I'm not ready for a puppy oh. right now, but in two years, he has I've, said. Been, I've said many times, the next dog I'm going to get is a working lab because I think they're freaking yeah. great. He does like labs. I have a Malinois, which are... They're a lot of dog. They're a lot of friggin' dog, you know? Well, I get asked all the time, do you breed the American lab or do you breed the English lab? Yeah. And when people ask me that, I want to reach across the airwaves and smack them. <laughs> um, you know, and us Americans, we have to label everything. Uh -huh. so we have to put a label on it. What I will tell you is <clears throat> I tell people we breed a classic looking lab with a desire to work. Okay. A lot of your show dogs are too large. The muzzle's too short. They couldn't retrieve a goose if they had to. And they don't have the stamina to go out and hunt a pheasant field for three hours. Yeah. Right. On the flip side of things, your field bred dogs, for the most part, are too energetic for your average family. Yeah. Um, they, they, you know, I'm Joe Smo Hunter, and I want a hunting dog, which means I'm going to go out and I'm going to find Master Hunter this and Field Champ that. Well, those people have no idea the time and effort and hours that went into getting to that dog to that level of training. Um, you know, that dog is trained a couple times a day, every day. It probably lives on the pro's truck or in the pro's kennels. Right. Um, not sleeping on your couch. Yep. So a lot of your 100% field bred dogs are, are way too energetic and high energy for the average family. Yeah, a pain in the ass, yeah. So I, I do say that our dogs... What they say is the labs, especially, have got to have an off switch. And I will tell you that our dogs, both labs and chessies, uh, have an off switch. Nice. And you're nice. placing the puppies responsibly, too, which is nice. So two-year wait list, the proof is in the pudding. Wes is definitely producing some of the best chessies and labs in the country. If you guys would like to learn more about him, again, it's Rise and shine retrievers.com. This was Wes Reed from Center Barnstead, New Hampshire. And we appreciate you coming on yeah. today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wes. Thanks for having me. We'll see you guys next week. Keep it quirky. <laughs>